Welcome to KJV Cafe, where the truths of God's Word come alive. Grab a hot cup of coffee or tea and spend some time learning about our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Listen now to Pastor Clark Covington of Heartland Community Baptist Church as he explores great insights from the Word of God. It's exam time. Everybody out there listening to this right now, get your pen and paper ready. It's exam time. How does that make you feel to take a test? If you're like me, you don't like tests very much. Amen. I never was a great test taker. And uh, I think I still have nightmares on occasion about taking exams. And yet there's something good about it. You know, if you think back to a test you might've done well on and you performed uh, above what you thought you could do. You studied hard and you know you put your thoughts there on paper. You gave the right answers and you get that good grade back and it feels good. And in a way, when we look at exams, what we're talking about is examination, right? And uh, the exams in school, they're there to uh, examine whether you know the information or not on a particular subject. But you know, the Lord calls us to examine ourselves and it's very helpful to go ahead and do that. And yet it's so hard and really counter to our nature. And so that's what I want to talk to you about for a little bit here today, exam time. You know, we're quick to look at others with a judgmental eye, especially when it comes to matters of the faith. Is that not true? Even more especially when it comes to criticism we've received from others regarding our faith, and we look at them and say, who are they to criticize us? We may look back at them and say, they really need to look at their lives and how they live and what they said about so-and-so and how they acted four years ago or 10 years ago. You know, we get defensive, don't we? Uh, when someone says anything about our faith or about us, we quick to point the finger the other direction. But let me ask you this question. If you're saved, should you have a problem with looking into the matter of your own faith? I mean, what good can come from such an exercise? It turns out a lot. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 through 6, we see this. Paul is exhorting uh, the church at Corinth to do this. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. So some context here. Paul, is, again, he's exhorting the church at Corinth to stop looking just at it, who he is and if he is truly of God, but to start looking inward to who they are and if they're truly of God. Paul asks, don't you know yourself if Jesus is in you or not? You know, it's a great question. Uh, for us to to ask ourselves, do we know ourselves? Are we uh, secure in our salvation? Do we, you know, really uh, believe that we were saved when we gave our hearts to the Lord? And you no, know, you don't have to have a specific time and date stamped uh, written down somewhere. Uh, the Lord knows, Amen. But there's certainly many ways that we can tell if we're saved, Amen. If the Holy Spirit's dwelling within us, and uh, that might be for another message. But here, I want to continue to look at this examination. You know, what application does it have for our lives? You know, why was Paul asking the church uh, at Corinth to do this? To show them that godly people exhibit godly characteristics. And you remember uh, probably that that church was a carnal church. And uh, godly people are willing to look inwardly to see God dwelling in them. That's the exercise Paul was trying to put them through, to look inwardly so they could recognize where the sin was in their lives and where the sin was in their church. But we can take the same lesson, couldn't we? You know, a mature Christian is one that is constantly seeking to know and grow in Jesus. You know, think about a mature professional in any uh, trade, in any part of uh uh, work today. You know, you think of uh, the craftsperson, right? That has uh, maybe been a carpenter for 30 or 40 years, and they're just excellent at what they do, or the home builder, or or uh, the the uh, welder. And anyone that's tried welding, you know, it's not easy to weld, amen? There's that welder out there that just knows how to do their job. Do you think they're afraid to look inwardly, to look at their 
skills, what they're doing and how to look at their craft. They're not afraid at all to look at where their knowledge could increase or where their knowledge has decreased. Um, you know, you look at the best of the best, uh, I think of sports, you know, I think of, uh, athletes and so forth, the best athletes, they have a measure of athleticism that is certainly just God's gift to them. And at the same time, they also analyze their own abilities, their own strengths and weaknesses to improve, to be even more excellent. You see that in the corporate world, you see it everywhere. And why is we, why are we as Christians, uh, so frantic, to not do that? Why are we so uh, apt to criticize others and not look inwardly? You know, it's a, it's a sign of a mature Christian. You know, we should be growing. We should be seeking to be experts in the ways of the Lord, because you know what, when you become experts in the ways of the Lord, when you dig down deep and you say, I got to know Jesus, I got to know everything about Jesus. I want to know his commands. Uh, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles and I'm in a Gentile group here, not Jewish. So I would like to know what is going on uh, with everything in the Pauline epistles and everything that Paul has wrote, everything that Jesus taught. I want to know all of it, right? Ephesians 3, 17 through 19, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. That's Ephesians chapter three, 17 through 19, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. The operative word there by faith. How is Abraham justified uh, in God's sight? By faith. Amen. Uh, we, we, faith is so important. We can't uh, our works won't get us into heaven. Uh, our pedigree won't get us there. Our church membership won't get us there. It's by what? It's by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. And that comes by grace alone. So faith in God, we believe Jesus is God. We believe he did die on the cross for our sins and was miraculously resurrected from the grave and walked the earth 40 days and 40 nights and ascended up into heaven and is at the right hand of the Father. We believe it. Amen. Okay, now that we have that faith, then we, what does uh, Paul say here in Ephesians 3? That we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. You know, here Paul's talking about the dimensions, amen? In other words, our inner self should be full of Christ and his dwelling, and we should be seeking uh, to understand the dimensions of his love, which is boundless, by the way. Uh, and then we're going to love him. But you know what? It's because he first loved us. That's 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. So we start looking at his love. We start realizing our own nature. We start learning more and more about ourselves. Um, it just just briefly here, I've, I've, I heard a pastor recently mention uh, that, uh, you know, when we look um, at, at uh, ourselves in the light of the Bible, we learn so much more about our sin nature than before we were saved. So we end up repenting more. And I believe that's completely true. Amen. We end up repenting more for our sin as a saved person than we ever did when we were lost in the world, because we didn't even know. I mean, I personally didn't even know when I was lost in the world, half of the sins I was committing. And, uh, as a preacher, the Lord just, you know, it, it, it just grips me, uh, how much I've trespassed against him, but yet how much he has forgiven me. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Amen. Understanding just who he is and what he has done to set us free on the cross. Amen. Understanding his great love for us today. Wishing none should perish. Second Peter 3, 9. In that verse, what does God want? He wants all to come to repentance, right? We have to repent for our sins. If we don't realize we're a sinner, then we can't be saved. Amen. If we see a lifeboat and it looks nice on the shore and we say that's a nice lifeboat, but I don't need it then you, you're not going to get on that boat, right? If you're on a sinking ship in the water and you see a lifeboat and it's coming near you, you're going to hop on that ship. We need to be recognizing our sin nature, our fallen nature, and hopping on that lifeboat, which is our salvation is only found in Jesus Christ. When this happens, we're filled with the fullness of God. We then can look and know the dimensions. We can know the length and the breadth and so on of Christ's incredible love for us. You know, what happens when, when this occurs? You know, we're talking about examination, right? We're talking about this development and this walk in, in Christianity where we grow as, as saved Christians and mature and desire to, to, to really live the faith and not just be uh, hearers of the word, but doers, amen. 
Well, what happens when you love, when uh, someone loves you a lot? What happens when someone loves you a lot? You don't want to disappoint them. You know, my grandma, Jenny, uh, my daughter is named Jenny Rose after my grandma. Her name was Jenny and uh, she loved roses. She had a big rose garden. So we named our daughter uh, Jenny Rose. She's about to be five years old. Uh, sweetest little girl I've ever seen. Uh, uh, sweetest little girl daddy's ever laid his eyes on. It's my only girl. And uh, man, I love Jenny Rose. But let me say that she's named after my grandma, who was just so sweet to us growing up. And she, uh, we lived in the same house she lived in for many years and she cared for us. And she was just an encourager and, and, and a shining light in a very kind of otherwise dark situation. And there was uh, a lot of bad things happening. And, and as I look back on it, spiritual warfare and struggle and, and strife and just rich with problems. And there she was, loving us, loving myself and my brother, encouraging us and, and being a blessing to us. And guess what I, I wanted to do, even as a young man, even as a rebellious teenager, what I wanted to do, I wanted to impress her. I wanted to please her. And I didn't want to disappoint her. Now, when we think of God, is that how we feel? Do we have loyalty to God and affinity to God? Has he made a mark on our lives? Do we not want to disappoint our Lord and Savior? Do we want to be loyal to our Lord and Savior? Do we want to impress our Lord and Savior? Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Amen. Hey, you know, the Bible says we should be a blessing to God, right? We should, you know, God always blesses us. We should have a sincere desire to bless him. Amen. To not only not be ashamed of Christ, but to be so proud of Christ, to be so in love with Christ, to be living for Christ. Amen. He is good. He will bring joy to your heart. I can testify that tonight, but let me move on for time's sake. Inwardly, we must look and then outwardly, this will show how by their fruits, you'll know them. That scripture spoke about Jesus regarding judgments and false prophets in Matthew chapter seven, verse 20. And so as we love on the Lord, that's going to manifest through our actions. So you're going to see fruits of the spirit, joy, peace, and so forth, temperance, long suffering. But if we are truly uh, not living for the Lord, if we're reprobate, then that's a problem. And that also will show. So as we examine ourselves, we're actually going to learn a lot about our walk with the Lord. I hope that makes sense here uh, today. But let's look at what a reprobate looks like. You know, Paul mentioned it in our text verse here uh, that uh, he said, but I trust ye shall know that we are not reprobates. And he's saying, um, basically, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. And so what does it mean to be a reprobate? Well, this term, as I've come to know it, as I've researched it in this, in this light, uh, means not acceptable to God. Uh, not holy. God is holy, and what is acceptable to God is holiness. Amen? We on our own can never be holy enough for God. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross and then be resurrected as the perfect propitiation, the payment for our sins. And Jesus, perfect, sinless, God in the flesh, puts on our sinful shoes, our sinful jacket, our sinful garment, drinks of that sinful cup for all of mankind one time. And when we accept Jesus as Savior, we are saved and the Lord no longer sees our sin. That's cast uh, as far as the east is from the west. Amen. The Lord sees Jesus in us. We are now uh, righteous through Jesus. Amen. That's such a relief to know because I can't do it on my own. I don't know about you, but I can't do it on my own. But I can claim Jesus when I get to uh, see the Lord. I will just say, Lord, I'm a sinner, but I'm claiming Jesus. And I believe in, I trust, I live by Jesus Christ alone. Amen. But what does the reprobate look like? They're in their own works, their own thoughts, their pride, and that will never satisfy God. They're prideful. Uh, and Romans 1, 28 through 32 describes this. Even And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, even as they, who's they, this is reprobates, they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. They don't want to think of God. They don't want to think of the things of God. They don't want to be called out by God. They don't want to be bothered by God. Why? Because they're living unholy, and that's an offense to God. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, 
but have pleasure in them that do them. Whew. Romans 1, 28 through 32, what I just read, gives you an idea of what it means to be reprobate. And it shows uh, that God gave them over to this reprobate mind, okay, to do things that are not convenient for them. So what happened here is God says, okay, you're a sinner and you know my judgments. You know the wages of sin is death and you're going to live this way anyways. Well, then my punishment on you will be to give you over to that sinful mind. See? Uh, and that is awful. You know, convenient is a fit, suitable, proper, adapted use. Uh, feed me with food that's convenient for me. So if you look at this, let's take the word fit or suitable. God allowed these uh, that wouldn't help, he, uh, wouldn't keep him in mind to be given over to the things that are not suitable for them. He let them be basically in their own hog pen and said, have at it. Do you see how bad that is? That's the worst thing that could ever happen to us is to be distant from God. And why would anyone be distant from God? Well, look at the devil himself. Pride, rebellion. This is how the reprobate mind starts. The person doesn't think they need God or they don't want God. They don't want to retain him in their knowledge. Whew, and bad things happen. God says, here, have at it. The wickedness we just see today in um, all over our country, all over the world, matter of fact, can come from this reprobate mind. God's judgment on them is to let them live in their own sin. This is a harsh punishment because the wages of sin are death. When we live for ourselves, the worst thing that can happen is that God leaves us alone. And that's why the cross is so disruptive. What God had to do to buy us back, what God had to do to redeem us, because we on our own can't do it. We can't ever, ever meet up to the law. We can't ever meet up to holiness. We can't ever meet up to God's standard. We're in the flesh. We're sinful creatures. Christ dies for us. When he does that, he pays the price for our sin debt. We're saved. When we get saved, what do we have? The Holy Spirit dwelling within us. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We start living for God because we have God living within us. See, our salvation is so important. But beyond being saved, what's next? It's staying close to God through prayer and through fellowship, through gratitude, through Bible study, through Christian service. You know, we must stay close to God. We must understand that the punishment uh, for the reprobate, for those that are not acceptable to God, for those that have chosen to reject uh, his free gift of salvation, his punishment is to hand them over to that reprobate mind, to let them live in that sin. And, and you know, they're in complete bondage. So they think they're having the time of their life or they're miserable, one or the other, but either way, they're separate from God, and they don't even realize they're in bondage to this world. And the little G God of this world, he's got his little traps, his little bait, uh, materialism, uh, covetousness, uh, lust, lasciviousness, on and on and on. And so they're just in roped up, yoked up to these things in complete bondage. And so when we look inwardly and we say, you know, Lord, when we sin, does it bother us? Does it convict us? That's a telltale sign of, are we living for the Lord or not? Right. And we, we can really grow deeper and deeper in our relationship with the Lord by simply just praying spending time in his word, being convicted, because you know what happens when we turn ourselves to him, when we seek him, he will show himself to us. Amen. That's what I'm preaching about this coming weekend. The Lord showing himself to us when we earnestly seek him. And what was happening here with the reprobate mind? They didn't want to retain him in his knowledge. They didn't want to look at God at all. And we must seek him. This is much of the world today that's gone afar off from God. It's so sad. You're listening to KJV Cafe. As you learn the great truths in God's Word, we encourage you to take the verses mentioned in this episode and study them. Trusting God will open your eyes to a deeper understanding of Himself. Now here's Pastor Clark with the rest of today's message. So what does it mean to be accepted by God, to live for God? What does it mean when we examine ourselves to know we are doing something right for God? Let's look at what it looks like, because it's from the same author, from Paul. 
Paul describes his life and his ministry, his goals and his inward looking. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 27. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law as without the law, being not without the law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them without the law, that are without the law. To weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. What a great verse. And this I do for the great gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race all but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible I therefore so run, not as uncertainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Okay, a lot to see here. Imagine someone preaching and teaching about how to run a marathon and win, and then they get in the race and are so out of shape they can't finish the first mile. Imagine that many that saw that man teach this doctrine witness such a thing. What happens to the credibility of this person? What happens to the message? See, Paul was steadfast in living his life to match up with his message. You know, when he told the church at Corinth to look at themselves, to look inwardly, to stop looking at others, but to look inwardly, he wasn't saying, I'm a hypocrite. I'm telling you to do something I wouldn't do. He's saying, look, I'm looking inwardly to the point where if I'm around a, uh, a, a free person, I'll be free. If I'm around a servant, I'll be a servant. If I'm around the Jew, I'll be a Jew. And if I'm around the law, I'll be under the law. If I'm around those that are without the law, I'll be without the law. If, if I'm around someone weak, I'll be weak. He made himself, again, uh, this is 1 Corinthians 9, verse 22. To the weak I became, I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. All things to all men by all means to save how many? Some. We know not all will be saved. Amen. We just sow those seeds. We plant those seeds and the Lord will, uh, you know, uh, let them grow where he sees fit. Amen. We can, all we can do is be a witness. All we can do is uh, testify to the goodness of God. But what Paul is saying is, I'm looking inwardly to see, am I uh, humble enough? A am I causing an offense? Am I living in a way that would turn someone off from the gospel? Is my behavior in any way unseeming? Now, I think a lot of Christians at first, they look at it like, well, I just need to kind of look the part so that no one will be offended outwardly, you know, just I, I need to keep myself under some control. But what Paul is saying is he was living the part, amen? He was living it, not because works save him, saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, but by the fact that he was living, he's living the gospel message by being weak to those that are weak, by, you know, being uh, without the law to those without the law, et cetera, et cetera. He was living it, amen? And because of this, he was able to boldly ask uh, the Corinthians to look inwardly because he had, obviously, and was living it and saying, I'm walking the walk, are you? Bringing body and mind into subjection so we're not found to be a hypocrite. We are made credible to be God's appointed ministers and messengers. And Paul uh, ran the race with great effort. He was uh, not just uh, talking the talk, but he was walking and running. Uh, as he should have been. Amen. And what we see with the Lord is the Lord will say, okay, I'm going to give you some understanding in my word because it all comes from God, right? We, when without God, we can't understand his word. We can't discern it. It is all God. Ask any Holy Spirit filled preacher and they'll tell you when they're studying the scriptures, this, a lot of the points in their message, it just comes to them. Well, where does it come to them from? The air? No, that's coming from the Holy Spirit. That's all from God. Amen. And so what we need to do is get a hold of God, the knowledge that God has in his word, put it into practice what God allows us to discern and understand. 
and then allow God to mature us and use us as he see, sees fit. And we can grow that way. Amen. We can grow that way. And that's how you grow as a Christian, by looking inwardly and not being afraid to ask the question, could I do better? You know what? Could I just carve out an hour every day to read the Bible? Or if I'm doing an hour every day to read the Bible, could I carve out 30 minutes or an hour just to pray? Just to pray. Um, okay, if I'm doing those things, you know what? Could I carve out an hour or two on the weekend to uh, mail out some gospel tracts with COVID? Maybe you can't knock on doors. Mail them out. Uh, maybe uh, write an editorial to the paper saying, I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Amen. See if they'll publish that. Uh, you know, do some ministry work. And, you know, we talk a lot in our church in this day and age right now with the lockdowns and all these things. We are having to be creative with how we're approaching the ministry. And we are going uh, through a, a really grow, a growth phase is the best way to put it. We're having a lot of ministries growing here, but a lot of them are focused on correspondence and internet and radio as you're hearing and so forth. So if we put forth the effort, God will bless and he'll grow us in this and we will grow as Christians. That's the test. The test is your actions. The test is your actions. Galatians 1, 9 through 12. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I ple yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul in Galatians here is saying, Jesus Christ directly revealed this teaching to him, and he is teaching it not to please man, but after what the Lord would have him to do. We must do this as well. We must teach and preach and minister to others uh, fully by God's grace, by, by the Spirit given to us, by our effort only in what he would have us to do, being prayed up, studied up, etc., Living as a servant for Christ, amen. Living as a servant for Christ. Not living for man. Are we living for him or man? You know, are we abiding in his ways or the ways of man? Is he getting glory from our lives? If our actions told a story and we wouldn't be able to speak anything but just our actions, imagine keeping a log book and just logging all your actions every day, all day, and then you hand that book over to someone and they interpret what your life is about. Would people say, oh, that person's on fire for God? Or would they say, hmm, uh, that person's ordinary citizen of the world? You, know, you can't be one and the other alike. You're either on fire for God or you're living for the world. Now, that's what Paul was saying here. And that's the test. Our test is our actions. The exam is, how are you living for the Lord? No, we're not saved by works, but, but it shows our love for the Lord and works are manifest out of our time spent with the Lord, and he gets the glory from it all. And if you see a Christian that just doesn't want to do a whole lot for Jesus Christ, I would guess they're not spending a ton of time in their Bible. And the inverse, if you see a Christian on fire for God, I would guess they're spending a, quite a bit of time in their Bible and in prayer, etc. So I, and I wish I could go into more detail, but understand here today, the Lord has a test for you, and you can pass with flying colors if you so choose, or you can be uh, willfully ignorant, as the Bible says. Uh, but I, my hope my prayer here today is that you look inwardly, that you seek God with all your heart and soul, that you live for him, that you realize that the Lord cares about everything in your life, and he wants to use you. And it starts with just getting on your knees, repenting before God, getting right with God, and making that best effort. Amen. He knows the context of your life. He knows what you can and can't do. So give it your all here today. Give it your all for Jesus. Let's get after it. Let's serve him. Let's live for him. Let's pass that test. Let's run that race, and let's run it like we are going after the prize. Amen. And one day we'll have that crown uh, in heaven, and it'll be worth it. It'll be all worth it. Thank you so much for listening today. God bless you. Thanks for visiting the cafe today. Our goal is to inspire you with the truth and depth of God's word in a straightforward manner. Do you know Jesus? You can today. 
Visit kjvcafe.com to learn more about God's great plan of salvation for all of mankind. Until next time, remember, as Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 puts it, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Righteousness.